talked about Mother Maria. Uh, we've already talked about Mother Maria at least once before, quite a while back. And this month, as it so turns out, uh, um, we are sharing from a parish uh, that I know back east a whole bunch of mo daily meditations from Mother Maria. Oh, so, you're beautiful. Yeah, they're very good. She was quite a writer, as in addition to being quite a social activist. Um, she was born Lisa Polenko. Um, in 1891, uh, and, and believe it or not, she was born in Riga, Latvia, uh, to a Russian family, a Russian-speaking family. Uh, it was a fairly wealthy family because uh, they not only had a house in Riga, but they also had a house in, or an apartment in St. Petersburg, and they had a country home and estate uh, very close to Odessa. Uh, later on in her life, um, uh, Lisa Polenko or Mother Maria would become the first female mayor of the village of Anapa, uh, which, which is in uh, the Crimea there, the, uh, the, the portion that Russia has taken back. This is a photograph of Lisa Polenko, later to become Mother Maria Skotsova, uh, when she was probably about 12 years old or so. Um, beautiful child, very gifted child. Uh, from the beginning, as soon as she was in school, uh, her teachers noticed that she had excellent skills, um, not so much in singing. Apparently she, apparently she was absolutely tone deaf. <laughs> but when it came to drawing, <clears throat> art, uh, when it came to um, language, uh, writing, uh, this is where she really excelled, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Later on in her own life, she would, on the side of uh, the other things she was doing, um, keep up a very active literary existence. So uh, in, in her library or literature that is preserved, I think we have three or four plays. They're short ones. They could be put on by young people. Um, and there are at least a couple of short books of poetry. Um, she regularly and, and, and consistently through her life, um, you know, wrote poetry. But she also kept a diary. And uh, in addition to that, later on, when she was uh, in uh, an, uh, a nun, uh, she did quite a bit of uh, essay writing for the journals and publications there among the Russian community in Paris. Um, <clears throat> this is a little bit later on. I believe she's probably in her late teens or early 20s here. Um, she moved with a very exclusive uh, literary circle in St. Petersburg. Uh, the names may not mean much to you, but a very famous literary critic named Marijovsky and uh, a very important Russian writer, uh, poet, and an essayist named Alexander Bloch. In fact, uh, it, it's, it's almost the case that uh, Lisa Polenko had some kind of a crush on Bloch because she went to him, uh, badgered him into taking her on as a private student, and then kind of, um, I almost want to say, shadowed him or, 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 or sort of hung around so much in his life. And he never, he never said, get out of here, go back home. But she sort of tried to make herself um, his protege. And to some extent, this must have worked because he did confide in her um, and, and certainly taught her what he could about the art of poetry and, and literary skill in general. In, general. Um, in this literary world in St. Petersburg, she also uh, met her first husband. This is another picture of her early in life. Um, she met her first husband. Um, it, was, uh, it was a very tumultuous relationship, and his name was, uh, 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 last name was uh, Kuzmarev. They didn't la last very long as a couple. Uh, I don't think the marriage lasted more than a year or a year and a half or so. Um, and then she was, you know, seeing various people, and bang, in the middle of her uh, still young adulthood comes the Russian Revolution. Um, and her family leaves St. Petersburg 
and decides to try to ride it out in a safer location in their house in Crimea, in the near to the village of Anapa. They had a, a country house, which was really an estate with uh, vines and all. Um, now, here we see uh, Lisa Polenko, she's probably still in her 20s here with her three children. All the way over on the right is um, uh, her daughter, Anastasia. Uh, she had him with her first husband. In the middle is her son, George or Yuri. And then uh, the little, the baby there is uh, her daughter, Guyana. Um, during her lifetime, before she was in her late 40s, she lost both of her daughters. Um, Anastasia fell in love with a guy who needed to leave Paris and go back to Russia to be part of the revolution and the ongoing changes there. And she accompanied him and died there. I think she was only 19 when she died. And um, the story is, is that she had a, a botched abortion. Um, the little girl, uh, who is only an infant in this picture, um, lived to be about eight years old and then died of meningitis. Uh, this would have been in the 19, early 1930s. And that left her just with her, her son, George, who was in the middle. And George um, ended up working with um, uh, Lisa when they set up the Houses of Hospitality in Paris and in the outskirts of Paris. And he was a pretty talented guy, a very good student and a seminarian studying for the priesthood. Um, and he lived there at the House of Hospitality, but he also, um, you know, eventually found his way um, to the concentration camps with her, but that's getting a whole, ahead of the story a little bit. This is another picture of them. So she knew something about marriage. She knew something about parenthood. She married a second time. And the second time that she married, I'm just going to go through this real quickly. She married a guy who was in the military at the time in the white army and who was the military judge before whom she had to appear uh, being accused of being a Bolshevik. This was in Crimea. His name was Daniel Skotsov. Uh, she so was able to defend herself. She was so good on her feet that not only uh, was she found innocent of being a Bolshevik operative, uh, but in fact, Daniel Skotsov fell madly in love with her and they married. And when eventually they decided with um, her child from the first marriage and the other two that they had together, that would be uh, the, the little girl, uh, Guyana and, uh, and uh, George, uh, when they decided to emigrate, they first went, as many Russians did, uh, to Prague, and then eventually to Berlin, and then finally to Paris. And when they reached Paris, like many other immigrant Russians, they faced a, an enormous amount of prejudice. Um, they were given Nansen uh, documents, Nansen passports, which were um, thought up at the end of the First World War to give displaced people a chance to settle somewhere else. It's something that would could be considered to be radical today, but it was a passport that you could use in any European country. It's called Nansen because of the man who promoted this through the League of Nations. Uh, so they went to Paris on Nansen passports. Daniel Skopsov was a taxi cab driver and uh, Lisa, she still was, decided to try to support the family any way she could. So she did a lot of sewing, uh, she did house cleaning, um, she did anything she could to make some money and uh, the family eked out a survival existence there. But when the older daughter died and when the younger daughter died within a year or so of each other, um, she was absolutely crushed. And uh, her marriage was also failing and the death of two children certainly didn't help the marriage any either. Um, and she went to the bishop and said, I want to serve those who are in need. Um, I've already done some trips to various French cities. I visited with emigres, some of whom were put into um, sanitariums, 
and mental hospitals because they didn't know enough French and people thought there was something wrong with them and their behavior was off. She said, I wanna be able to serve people in need and I wanna do this as a nun, as a sister, but I do not wanna be a cloistered nun. And the Bishop who was a rather remarkably forward looking man, his name was um, Evlogi, said to her one day as they were riding the Paris Metro and came out from the underground uh, to the elevated part of it out into the brilliant light right away, he said to her, well, he said, I will allow you and receive your vows as a sister only if you make the world your monastery. In other words, if you and your companion sisters, um, like the Catholic sisters, uh, become actively involved in serving the community around you, the community of people in Paris. This is exactly what she did. And we see her here after she had taken the veil, as it were, after she was professed as a nun, uh, with two of the people who came to, to join her. Uh, eventually, I believe there was a, a third sister, and she even was able to convince uh, a monk, who was also a priest, to be the chaplain of the place. She, she was very good in development. She was very good at shaking people down for, for funding. And she got the American YMCA, which was doing a lot of relief work in Paris, in part to help her. She got the American Episcopal Church uh, to help fund her. Uh, and what they did is they set up an organization, not unlike the BMA, they called it Orthodox Christian Action. And they rented a fairly large house on Rue de l'Hermel. It doesn't exist anymore. It was uh, destroyed during the war. And now there's a different uh, apartment house on the place. But it was a very old 19th century mansion with, I don't know, something like 12 bedrooms, um, a huge sort of uh, uh, dining room that they turned into a mess hall downstairs. And then out in the courtyard, you know how Parisian buildings are, you, you have the part that's on the, the facade that's on the street, and then the major part of the building, and sometimes two wings, and maybe even a wing in the back. Well, there was no wing in the back, there were two wings on the side, but in the back, there was kind of a barn or garage, uh, and this picture is taken right out in that courtyard because they turned the garage or barn into a church, uh, and in fact, the, the, asked the bishop to make it a parish, and so they had kind of an amazing thing, just like the Catholic worker houses that Dorothy Day had set up. They had a uh, house of hospitality for anybody who needed a place to stay, anybody who needed a meal, anybody who needed uh, medical help because they, she contracted with the local uh, clinic. And she also, for example, even when times were tough in the depression and even during the occupation, a Nazi occupation, she became an official canteen or feeding place from the uh, Paris government. So in other words, she, she engaged in the social services that were available at the time because she was not just doing religious work, she was doing you know, the very basic work of feeding people, sheltering people, <clears throat> keeping them alive. Um, this is a collection of people who were very important to her life. All the way over on the left is her mother, Sophie Polenko, who came to live with her. And then the, the very good looking young man just to Sophie's right is George. This is uh, when he was living in, uh, and working at the House of Hospitality and studying at the very famous St. Sergius Theological Academy. Uh, the next guy is uh, Gregory Barbazian. He is another seminarian who also lived at the House of Hospitality. Then you see Mother Maria. And uh, in the middle, this guy is a very famous Russian historian who eventually came over and taught not only at Harvard, but at Columbia. Uh, his name is uh, George Fedotov. In fact, I consider myself to be one of, in the line of people who tried to do the same kind of work he did. He tried to take the tools and methods of, uh, of scholarly historiography and apply them to the lives of the saints and to the history of the church. So in other words, the church and the saints do not get off easy. Um, they get studied with the same kind of scrutiny and care as any political figure. And of course, what it yields is the kind of thing that I've tried to produce in my books as a very human 
and a very um, uh, unsentimental, non-sentimental look at what holiness and faith actually is when people live it. Uh, the priest there in the cassock is Father Dimitri Kupinin. Um, he may not seem so young with his beard and his longer hair, which is the style of Russian priests at the time, but um, he was only in his late 20s and he was married and had uh, a couple of kids. And I have a personal connection all the way to him in that uh, his daughter is the one who introduced me uh, to the figure of Mother Maria, uh, showed me some pieces that had been saved from the concentration camp of her embroidery, shared with me the, the portfolio that they were presenting to the ecumenical patriarch, which uh, eventually uh, culminated in Mother Maria and Father Dimitri, who is here, uh, George, her son, and then a guy who's not in the picture, her treasurer, uh, Ilya Fundaminsky, being made saints, officially canonized and made saints uh, by the Eastern Church in 2004. The fellow all the way over on the right is well known in Russian uh, literature, Russian studies. Um, he's one of the foremost um, uh, uh, experts on Dostoevsky. Um, he certainly survived the war, uh, lived until I think the early 1960s, uh, but remained in Paris teaching at the Sorbonne, uh, Konstantin Machulski. Uh, this gives you a sense uh, of the fact that Mother Maria, as an intellectual, as a poet, as an artist, as a social activist, just like Dorothy Day did here in this country, attracted a, a very diverse group of people uh, to, to her house of hospitality. And here we see a collection of them uh -huh. in the evening, sitting down to dinner, which by the way, she would have scrounged from the then open air market at, at Les Halles, which now is where the Centre Pompidou is, the famous museum. And what you notice here is that this in fact is not all of the residents of the house being fed, this is who would show up for the salons. She conducted evening discussions with leading intellectuals in Paris, not just Russians, but Catholic and Protestant ones too. And you'll notice if you go around the table, these are all very young people. And I suspect that way down back in the left is a woman who I never met, but whose memoirs I've read, um, who ended up becoming a philosopher uh, and whose boyfriend took her here and she became absolutely um, obsessed with Mother Maria and, and really begged Mother Maria to take her on as a protege. Uh, and later, many, many, many years later, wrote about her experiences. She said, when you went there in the evening, they had the big samovar with tea. Somebody would always bring a bottle of vodka. There were all kinds of little canapes and finger foods. And, and baked goods. And they would be there till one in the morning, so excited talking about topics, talking about politics, talking about religion, talking about the needs uh, of those who were uh, down and out in Paris. So uh, if anything, this is really kind of the gospel at work. Uh, the very same thing was done at the same time in the Lower East Side by Dorothy Day, the great Catholic uh, social activists. Uh, they didn't know one another, but they were operating um, in, in, the, in uh, doing the same work. And yet there was a woman named Helene Izvolsky who migrated from Paris to New York and became a good, was a good friend of Mother Maria's and eventually became a good friend of uh, Dorothy Day's. Um, you know the end of the life. Um, eventually, Mother Maria and Father Dimitri uh, tried to hide as many Jewish people, as many people who were the other targets of the Gestapo as they could. Uh, what they tried to do is meld them into the parish. And in many cases, they would even write out, uh, not only enter them in the, the roster of members of the parish, but even issue them post-dated, backdated, baptismal certificates. And when accosted uh, about this, the priest, Father Dimitri said, um, it may seem to you like fraud, but we're saving lives. Um, and so now uh, what happens is that uh, somebody rats on them, the Gestapo come in, 
interrogate them, uh, beat them up, harass them, and then eventually ship them out. Mother Maria goes to the concentration camp at Ravensbrück, and uh, uh, the three, Father Dmitri, um, Ilya Fundaminsky, and Yuri Skoptsov, they all go to um, uh, um, an armaments factory in the Ura, uh, and they all die there. Um, the, the men die of, of dysentery and, and, and hunger. Mother Maria eventually, she survives almost to the uh, liberation of the camps. Uh, she dies on Good Friday in 1945, less than two weeks before the Soviet army came in and liberated the camp. But she took the place of somebody else who was in line going to the gas chambers. Uh, she had been sick for a while, but she survived almost three years in the camp, um, which says something about her stamina and her faith. She did Bible study there. She did daily prayer there. She did whatever she could to minister to people in the camp. And this is one of the icons of her. There are a couple of others we'll see. This was made by a, a woman who I actually met, a wonderful woman um, who would have known Mother Maria when she was very, very young, Ma, uh, Maria Struve. And uh, in her left hand, uh, Maria Struve puts a little scroll, which is a sign that even though she wasn't ordained, Mother Maria was a preacher of the gospel and somebody who lived the gospel. And then in her right hand, she holds a cross. And in, uh, in Eastern icons, this is always a symbol of somebody who dies as a martyr. And officially when they were made saints, they were called those who suffered for their neighbor, suffered in order to save their neighbors. Uh, how about the next one, Patrick? We'll go through these pictures and then have a little time to talk. This is another one uh, of all of them together. And you see it on the scroll, wherever you are, my heart is with you, uh, taking into itself your tears and your sufferings. This came from one of the prayers uh, that she put into her writings. You see there Father Dimitri, uh, and then Ilya up on the top, he was the treasurer. He was only baptized in the concentration camps. He was a non-practicing Jew, uh, but he decided to ask Father Dimitri to baptize him in the camps. And then up at the top, Yuri, who, in fact, they've put into a cassock, uh, just sort of to remind you that not only was he Mother Maria's son and a helper at the House of Hospitality, but he was also uh, in preparation to be a priest. And he continued to do some kind of mentoring and study with Father Dimitri in the camps, but both of them died of sickness there. Um, I think there's a couple more. Um, Patrick? Yeah, this one was in my old parish, uh, and it was painted by uh, a woman iconographer who, uh, into whose home uh, came Father Dimitri's widow and Father Dimitri's two children. So there was a personal connection between uh, Olga Palukin, who was a good friend of Jeannie and myself, and Mother Maria. She, she hardly remembers Mother Maria. She, she knows that she used to be put to sit on Mother Maria's lap, but she very it doesn't have many memories of her at all. But for a good three or four years, uh, Father Dimitri's wife, Tamara, and uh, the two children, uh, Paul or Pavel and Elena, uh, and Elena is the one, Elena um, uh, uh, is the one who I mentioned before, uh, who in fact uh, uh, introduced me to Mother Maria's life and so on. These icons, by the way, have some scenes around them. They're called Vita icons, icons with the life. So up here in the right-hand corner, there is um, Metropolitan or Archbishop of Logi uh, receiving her as a nun. Uh, in the right of being received as a nun, you come in wearing a white garment and then they put the black habit on you and the veil on you and they cut your hair a little bit. It's called the tonsuring. Uh, over up at the top in the left, um, this is where Mother Maria is uh, uh, lamenting the death of her daughter from meningitis, who was only about six or seven years old. That's Guyana. And then uh, just below that, that, you see her at the doorway of the chapel at the House of Hospitality, uh, welcoming people in. And over on the right, 
she's scavenging for food. Well, the iconographer, I think, took this too literally. Mother Maria and a, and a couple of other of her helpers would go at the end of the of the you know the uh, the farmers market or the open air market. They would go at the end of the day, and they would tell the baker, "We'll take all the, the bread that you didn't sell," and he'd give it to them. And they'd go to the greengrocers, you know, to those with vegetables, produce, and they'd say, "You're not going to take that back, right?" Give it to us, we'll make soup, we'll make stew. And they would even go to the butchers and say, you're not gonna bring all that meat that's been sitting out here all day long back to your butcher shop, right? You're gonna give it to us so that we can feed people. Uh, and that's what they did. Um, and she missed oftentimes the prayer services and some of the other sisters used to say, where are you? You're supposed to be here. You're the superior of the house. And she said, you do the praying, I'll go get the food because in the end we have to eat. And prayers by themselves are not going to get us dinner. And down at the bottom uh, of the left, you see a kind of stylized uh, image of the table set in the House of Hospitality. You saw a photograph of it a minute ago. And uh, then all the way over at the right is the crematorium and the barbed wire and uh, Mother Maria comforting her fellow prisoners at the Ravensbrück um, concentration camp for women. Down below on the bottom is something that happened in 1942 uh, when all of a sudden uh, after invading and, and occupying Paris, the Nazis decided to round up all the Jews and send them off to the concentration camps. Before they did that, they put quite a few of them, some 10,000 or so, into a cycling arena. It was hot, it was July, they had no food or water, so a lot of the churches uh, brought food and water. And when Maria came, um, you know, with her people from the, the House of Hospitality, she noticed there were a lot of garbage cans. So what she got into her head is that every time she would go inside with food and stuff like that, one of her workers uh, would take a kid, a small kid, stick him in a garbage pan, and that pail, and then they would carry that garbage pail back out. In other words, saying, we're getting rid of the refuse that's in here. And she made a deal with a guy with the truck. And when she would load up six or eight or whatever of these garbage pails that had not garbage in them, but Jewish children, uh, they would take them away and then put them into the Underground Railroad. Uh, we don't know how many she saved, but you know the, the people were in this cycling stadium for almost two weeks. And we know that Mother Maria went every day. And we know that this happened because one of Maria's assistants later on after the war was over said, we tried to save people as best we could. They also did have a network of safe houses, a kind of an underground railway system in which uh, they took people uh, before they were arrested and tried to get them out of the city. Um, this is a, another icon of her. Um, uh, she is a, her hold, she is holding herself an icon of the Mother of God uh, and Christ, kind of the Pieta, uh, the Mother of God holding the body of Christ after he's, it's been taken down from the cross. Uh, the very last thing that Mother Maria worked on in the concentration camps was an embroidered icon of this scene of the Mother of God holding on to her dead son. Um, a very different kind of um, icon of the mother of God. Usually you see her with uh, of the Christ child, but this is her son nevertheless. And it's a symbol of uh, the solidarity of Christ with all those who are suffering, whether suffering from hunger or just suffering from persecution or hatred. Um, and Mother Maria wrote a number of essays in which she suggested that we should also consider trying to be like the mother of God uh, whose heart broke, but uh, who nonetheless, you know, uh, uh, took care of her, her child throughout his life and even went to the empty tomb on, on Easter, Easter morning uh, to discover him gone. So there's the feeling that she, you know, remained his mother and loved him even to the horror of his death and his burial. And, and afterwards rejoiced in the risen Christ, um, the risen son of hers. So thank you for watching all of that. Um, uh, she was made, as I said, a, a, a saint in 2004. 
If I had a lot more time, I have actually some pictures of her canonization and of my very good friend, uh, all, all four feet, eight of her, uh, uh, a woman theologian who got me an icon card um, from that canonization, which I still have. And I'm trying to show you if you give me one second. But maybe some of you have a few things to say. Um, you, can, you can get every day from um, Margaret uh, some of the meditations on, uh, that Mother Maria wrote herself. And this is the, a copy mm. of the icon that they made for the canonization. So you see over here is Yuri, Mother Maria, Father Dimitri, and then Ilya Fundaminsky, and they're standing at the foot of the cross. So it says in Slavonic that they suffered uh, just as Christ suffered. They were passion bearers. They, they, uh, they died to save their fellow uh, brothers and sisters, their neighbors. Amen. 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 Oh, what a life. What a life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, and, and Dorothy Day's life, uh, uh, you know, again, if you know anything about her, I think we've talked about her in the past. Maybe we'll do that again. Same thing. Radical journalist in her youth, um, member of the Communist Party, um, and in many ways, not, not somebody you'd ever expect to be doing uh, the gospel works of mercy, but she has an experience of conversion after her lover leaves her with a child and uh, gives the rest of her life not only to opening these houses of hospitality, but being a tireless, absolutely tireless writer on behalf of uh, the poor against um, capitalism, <laughs> against war. Um, you know, she even had the nerve during the Second World War to say, um, I understand what's going on, but nobody can be happy about this, you know, and then continued doing that during the Cold War, and in fact was arrested numerous times for protesting the, uh, the nuclear buildup. Um, there's, there are wonderful pictures of her sitting on a bench in Union Square Park, right two blocks away from my campus where I taught, and, and, and the police coming and putting her and all of her Catholic worker people into the paddy wagons, as they call them in those days, the, the police vans and taking her into central booking. And of course they would spend an hour or two there and even maybe be thrown into a cell just to make it more difficult. And then of course they would be released because I mean, what did they do? They didn't go down to an air raid shelter or they refuse to break up a protest, you know, big, big crime, right? Yeah. So Michael, I'm, I'm going back to that table where the people came for the evening to, to talk and two things. One, the table reminds me very much of that wonderful um, painting on, the, on your book cover yeah. that we've been over, that everybody gets a chance to um, sit at the table. I love that. Just, I just love that. And um, the other thing is, what was the name of that young woman that came? You pointed her out in the back left of that table. And yeah, did you I like her it, memoir? I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll look it up and I'll, and I'll post it, okay? Yeah, um, did, did you like her writing about um, Yeah, she, she was really, yeah. Well, because what she did is she said, look, you know, uh, that's the one all the way back here on the left. Yeah, uh, she was brilliant. She had uh, she taught for 35, 40 years at the Sorbonne, a very, very gifted um, uh, uh, philosophical scholar, uh, not a believer, not not a member of the church. Um, maybe she had been baptized. Probably she had been. Uh, and yet um, this woman, Mother Maria, made an enormous impact on her life. And and, and how? Well, Number one, by being a gifted uh, uh, writer, uh, uh, an, an outspoken, you know, woman scholar, and third, by you know, uh, walking the talk, by by putting her money where her mouth was, by running a place where people could be fed, sheltered, and so on. 
So, you know, I think what it was was seeing a woman of courage, a, worm, a woman of conviction, a woman of intellect, and a woman of faith. In a time, remember, you know, this was the 1930s, where women were still trying to, to break through, right? Uh, only, only later on will there be a Simone de Beauvoir, for example. That will happen. I mean, she would have been alive at this time. I don't know that she ever showed up, and Jean-Paul Sartre never showed up at Mother Marie's place. But the great philosopher Nicholas Berdyaev used to go there, and um, Machulski used to go there, yeah. and a whole bunch of other intellectuals, again, not just Russian immigrants, but, but French intellectuals would show up there because... This woman was a, a force of nature. You know, she was, whoa, who do we have there, Patrick? <laughs> it's lefty. <laughs> oh, lefty. We know lefty. Yeah. Michael, can you hear us? I can hear you. No. Oh, can you? I can, this is yeah. Karen. I see it, George and Karen. Um, yes. I'm here. <laughs> Hi, George. So this was the... The Russian Orthodox Church that she was sainted yep. in 2000. Yes, it was the we, Western. We it was the Western European diocese of the Russian Church, but because mm -hmm. uh, because uh, Moscow sent an edict to Metropolitan or Archbishop of Logi saying you have to say that there is no persecution of Christians in Russia. Evlogi said, I, I can't in conscience say that. So what did he do? Mm -hmm. He then, you know, wrote or telegrammed the ecumenical patriarch and said, will you take us in? Because I can no longer stay part of the church in Moscow. We're seeing the same thing uh -huh. happen today. It happened in Ukraine three years ago, where a, a rather sizable church body said, we don't want to be part of Moscow and went to the ecumenical patriarch who gave them their independence. Um, and uh, now you see the same thing playing out. The, uh, sadly, the Patriarch of Moscow is nothing but a puppet um, and, uh, you know, somebody who defends what Putin is doing, even this nonsense that he's preserving the, the true Russian soul and the true Russian culture and the true Russian faith against the terrible West, you know. Yeah. So it was the Russian church, but it's interesting. Today. They, they were dissenters. They, they, they said, we can't stay. So, you know, those of us who understand the Reformation and if you will, the Protestant principle, um, it isn't just Protestants who have acted upon this. There have been plenty of Catholics and Orthodox who have too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Did you see the San Diego Tribune today? No, I didn't. Did, what, what did it have in it? Uh, it's an it's a article with a picture of the Russian right. Orthodox patriot Kirill. Yeah. Kirill. Yeah. And yeah. he saying that, um, that he gives a spiritual defense of yeah. the war, that it's a battle for. Yeah, he, he, he tries to, to describe it as a battle for uh, protecting Christianity and protecting traditional values. And yeah, <laughs> but you know what? Um, I was a signatory to, with about 300 other people, to a letter that was sent to him um, and uh, has been published. And in fact, I can find the, the posting of it and send it. Um, I can send it to Patrick and he can post it around where um, a number of uh, theologians uh, simply said there is no basis for what he's doing. I mean, he's he is simply propping up a, a regime. Uh, you know, nobody nobody should be deluded or, um, you know, uh, defrauded into thinking that he what he's doing is legit. It's not legit at all. And by the way, most of the Orthodox church bodies in the world, most of the head bishops of them have condemned this. There's a few that are, how shall I say it, um, indebted to the Russians for money, 
uh, and they have said nothing. But uh, the Greek Archbishop here in, in the United States, uh, the OCA, the Amer uh, Orthodox Church in America, their head bishop, the Archbishop, um, the um, uh, all over all over Europe, they've all come out and said, "No, you can't be defending this. This is violence and death." Um, this is not a spiritual battle. This is not something that you should say is uh, worthy of the church's blessing and protection. Mm -hmm. Could you hear Can that, you George and Karen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we heard. Thank you. That may be um, add That's some input. Add some interest to the article in the. Uh, I'll, I'll look it up. I, I get that online. Lloyd George. Yeah. That's that's you... where faith gets tough. Yes. Michael. Yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, I mean, stop and think of all the other examples we've had of that. You know, the other evening, George uh, Keith referred to Bishop Tutu. I mean, that's a perfect example of it, right? Yep. I mean, he, he put himself at personal risk for years uh, with the South African government. And then finally, when it was overthrown, um, he is one of the, the leaders and founders of the reconciliation movement uh, who heard unbelievable horrors about torture and killing. But they knew that going forward, if there was not reconciliation and forgiveness, there, there was no future. There would just be hatred perpetuated, right? And then think of Dr. King. I mean, you know, you can go down the list uh, with figures uh, and certainly not just restricted to Christian figures. Think of Gandhi, you know, who told his friend, the Anglican priest, George, whatever his name was, um, George, I love Jesus and I love the New Testament and I love you, he said, but when it comes to you Christians, <laughs> look at what you're doing to us here in the Raj in, in India, you know, in the name of Christianity and civilization, you've enslaved us, you know, and you treat us as less than human. Um, how does that, how does that, you know, sit with, with Jesus, you know? I understand that the Orthodox churches um, break down along national lines so that you have the Russian Orthodox Church, you have the Greek Orthodox Church, you have the Latvian Orthodox Church. Mm -hmm. um, do they have, a, you, you mentioned the ecumenical patriarch, I think mm -hmm. is, was the title. Is that sort of the equivalent of what the Archbishop of Canterbury would yeah, be? Yeah, I, I think roughly speaking. Communion. Oh, you're, you're our, our connection is pretty bad today, Patrick. Uh, but yes, the answer to your question right. is the ecumenical patriarch does play a role much like the Archbishop of Canterbury, much like the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, in that um, he is a symbol of the fact that all of these churches, no matter who they are, where they are, are in communion with one another, not just sacramental Eucharistic communion, but they confess the same creed, they read the same scriptures, they believe the same things. Uh, so it is, it is a very ancient um, way of a bishop being a symbol of unity. Now, supposedly that is to happen at the level of the diocese too. Although unfortunately, probably in the last century or so, bishops have largely become administrators and, and even though they technically are the chief pastor of the church in this area, um, sometimes the way that they do things and the way that they write and the way that they talk sounds much more administrative. Usually when they're there for a service, the liturgy, and they preach, uh, you, you can hear the pastoral again. But, but the trouble is, is that particularly uh, in, in the 20th and the 21st century here, as well as in other parts of the world, the models for church behavior um, has some, uh, come from the corporate world uh, and come from the political world. And so we, we rarely find a bishop who really is someone who will buck 
the establishment. Um, I think some people believe Michael Curry is close to that, um, but you know it's kind of difficult. It's it's rare that you find somebody, even if they're very capable administrators, it's rare that you find somebody who will stick their neck out. The other one that I would mention, probably because I know him and 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 think a great deal of him, is Rowan Williams, um, who got himself into endless criticism and attack. Uh, when he was the Archbishop of Canterbury. I mean, I, in fact, I, I had a few words with our Bishop here, Susan, uh, the other evening after the service. And, um, you know, I mentioned that I knew him and I mentioned that I, you know, still review his books and have been in contact with him. Um, and, and she said, well, you know, he, he wasn't very, you know, uh, supportive of gay and lesbian people back when he was the Archbishop of Canterbury. I said, yes but he now has come to regret that he did that to try to keep the Anglican communion from breaking apart. Uh, that was then, that was over 10 years ago. Um, I think if I understand him, that how do you do it all, all over, had he, had he been able to do it all over again, he probably would have come out and said, look, we have to, uh, we have to make it very, very clear there are no second-class citizens in the church. We do not exclude anyone. Everyone is a child of God. Everyone is a sister or brother of the Lord, period, period. And if you don't like it that way, well, then maybe, you know, you have to find your way somewhere else. And, of course, the bishop then reminded me of the Methodist. She said, we were ready to have full communion with them, but now we don't know who, who to have full communion with. And I said, well, George, who is here tonight, um, you know, who I introduced you to, I said, you, you can have full communion with him. I said, because there's a sizable chunk of the soon not to be united Methodist church uh, that will be uh, on the same page as the Episcopal church and the Lutheran church and so on. So, and then there'll be a group, they've already called themselves the global Methodist church. Um, they, they're going to leave on uh, May the 30th, I think it is. Yeah, they, they already said, we're out of here. We got our money. <laughs> you know, they, they've already decided to leave. The rest, they're going to have to figure out what to call themselves. And, and uh, I mean, there are still people who want reconciliation. But when the other group says, we're gone, goodbye, good luck, um, I don't know. I don't know what you can do. And, and the, as George will, will agree with me, the particular difficulty is is that the united methodist church is a global or international church it is not just an american church it has all of these bishops and and clergy and people from countries that still consider uh gay and lesbian people to be criminals and, and reprobates and stuff like that so there's nothing there's nothing you can do the anglican communion is dealing with the same thing um uh, whenever they gather, and they're going to gather again this summer at Lambeth uh, for a conference, um, there, are, there are bishops who come from Africa, and, and, and mostly from Africa, um, who say, no, we, we cannot agree with the rest of you. Um, maybe we won't even have communion with you. I don't know. Uh, but it's a, it's a time where Christians are finding themselves at odds with one another, just like all of us are finding ourselves at odds with one another over so many other things here in America, right? I sometimes, no, I, I, Go ahead, I sometimes wonder if it was a mistake <clears throat> for the United Methodist Church to expand into Africa and yeah. into the Philippines, because that's where we're getting a lot of the ultra conservative pushback yeah. that has made being a com communal church so right. difficult. That's it right. was also interesting to me when we drove by um, Bishop Tutu's house in South Africa that Nelson Mandela lived right down the street. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, they, they, they were, as soon as things opened up, they were the two to lead to the future. And Mandela fully endorsed the, the reconciliation uh, uh, committees and panels, yeah. There is an absolutely yeah. lovely chapter in uh, uh, Bishop Curry's book, Love is the Way, uh, about his uh, conversations with 
bishops from Africa, I believe, uh, mm -hmm. at Lambeth, and how they distanced themselves from him to begin mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. And then gradually over the period of time that they were together, they were able to come together. And it was, it, it's quite a wonderful chapter mm -hmm. about truth and reconciliation. Mm -hmm. It's, it's interesting in the, <clears throat> in the seventies and eighties, we attended world Methodist conferences where we had bishops and delegates from all over the world yeah, I, I, and, I think and Bishop we Susan's... And we weren't fighting. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, well, I think that's true. I think that's true of most churches. If you go back just a couple of decades, they in fact were united uh, for things like civil rights. They were united uh, against uh, very hostile, very oppressive governments. They certainly were united against the the, the, the Warsaw Pact, right, and the, the the Cold War, right. They 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 knew which side they were on then, and that's why I think so many people want to try to go back to that time. But you know what? You can't. Uh, if you if you've ever stuck your nose in the Bible, you realize that even from the very first wandering mothers and fathers, you know, Abraham and Sarah and so forth, you know, you, you're on a journey, you know, you keep, you can keep remembering the good old days and the good old place, you can't go back there. And, and, and that's not just a literal geographic thing, that is, that is intensely spiritual, you cannot go back to the comfortable past, you cannot go back to the comfortable little church, where everybody knew everybody, and had potluck dinners, and, and, you know, what they say about Episcopalians, when, wherever there's um, four Episcopalians, there'll be a fifth. <laughs> you know that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh. James? Fifth of liquor? <laughs> Bishop Susan made regarding um, art, art. Not hearing me. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Well, try it again. Try it again, Patrick. Yeah, I know. You're just having. Can you guys hear me that. now? I can hear you now. Yeah. Dr. Rowan. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take it up with you in person. Okay. 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 By the way, I wasn't attacking her or any other bishop all i'm saying is I, I've, I've experienced in my life i don't know about george i don't know about carrie i don't know about you patrick or george or karen but i think i sat down one no time i and i didn't think you were i i i was just going to say the same thing applies to the bishop well being it's just yeah it, it, Ah, the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I know. Maybe next time it'll be okay, better. Bad yeah, maybe next Active time. Active life it'll be balancing the personal view. Like they found a way to finally shut me up. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, before we close, and I'm going to ask someone to, to pray us out of here. Um, I would like to continue to do these on Tuesdays, if that's okay because it helps yeah. me to have a block of time where I have Zoom obligations. And then it means that, you know, a couple other days of the week, I have a little bit more flexibility. Okay, if, so if that's okay, uh, Patrick, maybe we can just keep uh, Tuesdays with Michael instead of when, going back to Wednesdays with Michael. Sounds good to us, Michael, thank you. Okay, and we'll, we'll be on the road for the next right. eight days. Okay. Oh, that's right. You're, you know, after tomorrow you're leaving. Right. right. Hey, you just got there, George. Happy I travels. Know. It's, <laughs> it's COVID. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. we figured a short trip was better than no trip. Well, well it was. I'm George, into that. And I, George and I got to do ashes to go. Uh, Patrick came and took a picture of us and he put it up there on the St. Barnabas Facebook page and the, and the website. And George and I were out there giving out ashes. It seems like <laughs> to the throng. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. In memory of Mother Laura. 
right. <laughs> oh, amen. George, would you pray us? Would you pray us out, please? George? Which George? You're the, you're the only one there right now. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that George, George and I'm Karen sorry. are still Lord, there. Lord, I'm sorry, George Bray. Um, Lloyd George Abrams, yes. <laughs> George Abrams. There we go. <laughs> Let us pray. Loving God, sometimes it seems like one step forward and two steps back. We know that you are guiding us. We know that your power and support is with us. Sometimes it just seems so difficult to see our way forward. Help us, Lord, to be a world community. Help us not to fight. Help us to, to look at our brother and sister in the eye and say, welcome. So to that vision, Lord, we ask your guidance and we ask your strength and deliverance be with us until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.